computer. Okay. Good. We're going. All right. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we bless you. We thank you. We worship you as our, as our origin, as our goal, as our final end. Um, we thank you, Lord, uh, although we're uh, right now in exile in a valley of tears, um, yet still even here you give us signs of your love and your grace. You provide for us and we ask your mercy now as we study this text and we look into the, what, what is our mind like? What, what Lord, uh, what's going on in our head all day long? So help us to be different than the world around us. Um, and we ask all these things in Jesus name. Amen. Good. I want to just quickly get up and just close my door so I don't disturb some other priest down the hall. <clears throat> Monsignor, if you'd like me to, to read tonight, can you hear okay. me? Okay, sure. Okay. That'd be great. So why don't you prepare it for 17 Angelica is just coming in. I want to um, say that uh, I'm really grateful. I was meant to call you earlier, but I was in the radio studio, and then I had to do communion calls. But I can see you're tired, Angelica. We did a great job with our, our Women's Day of uh, the retreat. It's all praise Jesus, right? Yeah. It's all him. Amen. So he opened the doors and um, yeah, no, Amen. you, uh, Holy Spirit threw it down through you again, Monsignor. So, All right. well, hey. like I said, if you, you point out that wasn't me, that was him. That was him. It was all Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. We are at Ephesians 4 and verse 17. And Stephanie will read. Why don't you read through verse 24? Okay. Now this I affirm and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to licentiousness, greedy, to practice every kind of uncleanness. You did not so learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Put off the old man that belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new man created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, now there's a, there's a number of words here that I, it, it's helpful to look at some of the Greek words that are underlying them. But notice again, it, it, I have, it, the first thing we want to see is this, this that he's kind of got an oath formula going on here. In other words, Remember how Jesus would sometimes say, amen, amen, I say to you, or amen, I say to you. It's a kind of a pay attention. I'm, I'm swearing under oath now that what I'm about to say is something you really need to listen carefully to. Okay. Uh, so again, um, uh, the, the literal Greek order of the words is this, therefore, I say and testify. That word martyros is in there, testify in the Lord. So in other words, I, I'm willing to die for what I'm about to say to you. Uh, so I, I testify, I'm a, I'm a witness. Uh, I affirm this, I solemnly tell you this, okay? So we start, this is kind of what we again would call an oath formula, okay? Uh, you must no longer to walk, no longer are you to walk as also the Gentiles are walking um, in the futility of their minds. Now, this word futility, um, you know, you could probably come up with some other, just an English thing that would be similar, but this, this word is, uh, uh, um, mm, it's a mariose, which means vanity or emptiness, um, unreality, purposelessness, ineffectiveness, instability, frailty, false religion. So if you're here to look at some of those things, vanity, there's a lot of empty. Vanity doesn't just mean, you know, you're looking in a mirror worrying about your, your, your how pretty you are. But vanity literally means empty, hmm? empty. So 
um, uh, lots of Lots of show, no no real product in the in the storeroom. Uh, a lot of stuff in the showroom window, but not much going on back in the storehouse. Uh, emptiness. Now, you know, there's a lot of emptiness today in people's minds in the sense that does life is life pregnant with meaning, or is it just another day to slog on and try to do your best and enjoy as much you can, and you know, it's basically meaningless. You know, and again, um, pur purposelessness is another way to translate this word. I mean, you know, again, this idea that what, what am I doing with my life? What's the purpose of what I'm doing? Why am I making this decision? Where does it lead? Where am I going with my life? You know, what's my goal? See, how many people even really think about that stuff? They're just kind of like a leaf being blown around. And, um, you know, it, there's no stability. There's no real purpose. Wherever the wind blows, they go with it, you know. And, um, uh, you know, there's just, uh, again, uh, again, an unreality, a purposelessness and so on. So, you know, we'll, we'll um, you know, we'll go with that. And, and also, um, sometimes this word can even be translated unreality. Now, here's where we're coming into a real problem today. People who think there's 50 genders. Well, that's just not real. That's, that's fake. Um, we come in two kinds, male and female. This is how God made us. The Bible says God made us in his own image, male and female. He created us. So there are not 50 genders. I, I love you too much to lie to you. Um, that's unreality. That's just not real. And yet people want us to indulge in the, you know, some of us who are older may remember the novel 1984 by George Orwell. And, um, in that novel, there came a moment where there was a certain man who was guilty of, quote, thought crimes because he wasn't thinking the way the state wanted him to think. And they said, you will agree to the following proposition, two plus two equals five, which is patently not true. It's not real. It's unreal. You will still agree to it. Or you will suffer the consequences because you're committing a thought crime. If you do not agree with us, you will not leave this room. Two plus two equals five. Say it. You know, and so again there comes this moment where you have to say in conscience, can I go on just living and declaring and going along with people's unreality? Or do I have to say, that's just not true. The emperor has no clothes. That is just not true. And more and more, we're being asked to live in a fantasy world and things where things are simply made up. So all of these are ways you could translate. Now that I affirm this and I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles, for us, we might just say the unbelievers or the secular people or the, you know, if you want to get political, the far cultural left or whatever. But you're not to walk as they walk in the futility of their mind. Ultimately, the whole thing is just futile because they're not really living in reality. And it will ultimately, reality ultimately bites. I don't mean in that, you know, bad say it, it's, it's a very stubborn thing. And, um, you know, you can, um, you can have all kinds of, you know, alternate theories about stuff, but at the end of the day, gravity's still there. And if you walk into a wall, you're going to bang your head. And you just, you just got to sometimes face up to reality. Now, I want to declare uh, that I've started to identify now as a 70-year-old man. I want, my, I want my Social Security payments to come early, please. Come, come, send them to me. Well, but, but you're not really 70. I know, but I'm identifying. You have to go along with this. But you see, I'm not a protected class. And um, so you see what I'm saying? This is the very strange double standard that we, we allow some people to live in total unreality and we're supposed to just bow and whatever they say, we're supposed to let them in the bathroom, farewell to women's sports, you know, the whole Equality Act that's being in Congress right now. You may have seen my article but, you know, we're supposed to just look the other way when a boy wants to go into a girl's locker room, um, when he wants to play on a woman's sports team. I mean, you know, on just this is not reality. And we're being told to go along. It's the same as two plus two equals five. Um, he's male. Well, no, 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 he says he's female. No, he's male. And that's just the reality. See, but they want to go on living in the futility, the, un, the purposelessness, the unreality of their mind. That's what Paul's saying here, okay? Now, in, in, in his times, again, there was a lot of rampant homosexuality and 
other other you know things that were going on at the time too. When I say homosexuality, I mean homosexual acts and things. And and again, these things were similar. You know, in some ways, his times were similar to ours. Um, and I don't know if there was much what you call transgenderism. I'm sure there was plenty of what they used to call transvestites and people who were a little confused about their sexual identity. But whether or not everybody went along with that, I don't know. But um, this is where we are today. And it is, it is a very, I'm not so concerned that there are some people who struggle with their sexual identity. Um, they deserve our sympathy and they deserve help, but they don't deserve us going along with a lie. Um, they deserve real help, you know, to help them to discover the man or the woman that God created them to be and thereby to um, find healing and wholeness, you see. And, um, you know, people go through these phases, especially in late teenage years where there's struggles about identity and differentiation and so on. And um, at the end of the day, um, most people get through this and they're fine. So we, uh, we ought not, okay, well, I don't need to go into, I'm not here to spend a whole last evening on transgenderism, but I just want you to see that this is probably, probably the most current example. Now, I affirm you not to live or walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Now notice, he goes on to describe their minds as darkened in their understanding and alienated from the life of God. Why? Because of the ignorance in them. Why? Because of the hardness of their hearts. So in other words, we can see that there's an ignorance, but Paul doesn't completely just write it off. Well, they don't know any better. They're too stupid to go to hell. He's not going to rob them of their dignity. Human beings have a basic grasp of what we call the natural law. Now, the natural law doesn't mean the law of nature. The natural law is that law that's accessible to our intellect, simply because we look around the world, the created world around us, and we observe its order, its purpose, what works, what causes and gives life, what brings death. We observe um, the interactions of various things, uh, not just scientifically, but even morally. We observe that, um, that uh, uh, adultery is a terrible violation of, of family ties and that the family is at the root of any civilization. And so, you know, that marriage and sexuality are important things to govern, um, that children um, are, are, are needy of our care and uh, that we have to, uh, uh, you know, I could go on and on, but these are things that any, anyone who's never opened up a Bible can see are basic values that are necessary to preserve both the individual and also creation and also the family, as well as culture and civilization. That without these things, certain laws that govern us that just, I just, I'm not allowed just to walk into your house and take your stuff, you know. That's a basic grasp of natural law that causes unrest. It causes violence. It causes fear and anger. So we, we observe simply, even before we say there's a God and he told us not to steal, we know that stealing is bad. We know that lying is not helpful to building trustful relationships. We, we, we understand that, that, um, that simply just sexually being sexually promiscuous is a very deadly thing to a civilization. You don't have to, well, just look, look out the front door, okay? Um, you know, these are the things that it doesn't take, you know, a, um, uh, you know, a, a Bible thumper to know these things. These, these things are available in what we call the natural law, which is, again, not the law of nature. Look how animals behave or something. But it's, it's, it's that law that's written in our hearts that is available to anyone who uses right reason and just observes how things work and how things don't work and where things are helpful and where they're very harmful. And so again, that's what we mean by the natural law. Okay. Now he, he says, therefore they are ignorant, but they're ignorant because of the hardness of their hearts. Okay. So let me just check a couple of Greek words here while we're talking, but I'll continue to give you a few things and maybe you have some questions or rebuttals or debate points for me, but I, I want to say that um, in, a, in a very um, um, particular way, notice again, I, I, you, you've, he you've heard me say this before, but very often today, the anger directed uh, particularly against the Catholic Church, because uh, we're, we're kind of public enemy number one, because we're like the last vestige, even though we're weak and um, divided among ourselves, 
there's some sense that um, we're the last vestige of, the, of that group, maybe with, along with some Orthodox Jews and some Pentecostals, we're the last kind of group that, that sort of holds to that old time religion. And um, it's a, um, it, it has to be rooted out. And so there's special, I think, hatred and anger. But why such anger? I, I, I want to uh, maybe say it to you because deep down, they know we're right. I told you just a minute ago, the natural law is etched into the intellect and heart of every human person. Our conscience, ultimately, I can, we could go on and on. Conscience is an act of judgment in the intellect that informs the will. I'm not going to get into all that stuff. I think just to say in a more phenomenological way that our conscience is the voice of God echoing deep within us. And we can paper it over with lots of stuff like, you know, experts say, or uh, my psychiatrist says, or Father James Martin says, or you can find anyone to tickle your ears and tell you something, but deep down, you know better you know better. And you're suppressing the truth, see? And therefore, this is a, 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 a um, um, what do you call it? A, Paul calls it, you know, uh, skotu, which is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a form of darkness, but it's self-imposed, see? It's a form of intellectual darkness um, that becomes a kind of a hardness of heart, a stubbornness that says, I will not believe, I will not do, I will do as I please, and no one will tell me this is right or wrong. I will decide for myself, you see. And this is where we begin to move from simple, shall we say, ignorance that could be innocent. You know, we have, there is such a thing as invincible ignorance, which means it's an ignorance that's not easily overcome. But at the end of the day, um, we, um, we end up uh, becoming very hardened. Our hearts get hardened and stubborn. Um, and um, see, what's the Greek word there? Porosin. Porosis. Oh, interesting. Porosis. Hmm. You know, we um, we have um, you know these osis. Of course, you know, in in English means usually some kind of disease or something that ain't good, right? So, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, hardness of heart. Um, and what's the what's the word for there's a there's a medical term for hardness of heart that has osis in it. Um, oh well, at any rate. Atherosclerosis. Yeah, sclerosis, atherosclerosis. Yeah. So all of these things is hardening, this hardness of heart, uh, and obtuseness that you just refuse to, you know, and instead of really listening, you just grow angry with the person who's saying, well, you know, that that's not really necessarily true. You know, and I don't mean to be a little bit gross here, but I mean, for example, you know, when it comes to say homosexual acts, you say simply, well, look, an exit is not an entrance. That's not the purpose of that part of the body. I know this is true for some heterosexual couples too. I mean, that's not the purpose of that organ and you're going to find trouble. And sure enough, there's a lot of both diseases and other, other things that occur uh, that often need medical attention because they're basically using organs and things for purposes that were not intended. And you can go on and say, well, you know, you're just all uptight. But at the end of the day, you know, um, the body doesn't lie. And um, we have to, somewhere we have to keep summoning people back to reality, okay? That certain things, for example, the theology of the body, with again, without getting too explicit, says that there is a part of you that is for someone else, of the opposite sex, of course. And so it summons you to a relationship that's fertile and, and uh, will, um, will bear fruit in, in children. And so the theology of the body teaches us that there are just, again, certain parts of us that are quite literally for another of the opposite sex, okay? And the body teaches, the body is a revelation, you see? So getting back to our text, you see, this is a very, the times we're living in now are very similar in some ways to what Paul experienced, uh, you know, and, and the early Christians experienced in the, the, the Hellenistic, the Judea, the, um, the um, uh, Greco-Roman culture that was around them. Uh, but you, again, you are not to walk like the Gentiles walk. What number one in the futility, the unreality, the the purposelessness of their minds. Right? They are darkened in their understanding. Okay, so they're darkened. They they don't they don't seem to get it. 
Why, though? Alienated from the life of God. Why? Because of the ignorance within them. Oh, then they're off the hook. No, read on. Why are they ignorant? Due to their hardness of heart. They won't listen. They won't take instruction. They won't even just entertain the idea that maybe there's actually some reason. You know, you're just a bigot. That's all you are. You're just a bigot. Go to hell. You were consigned to the theater. Just get out. You're no good. And, and you, you should be forbidden. You should be you're, you've engaged in hate crime. You, sh you should be criminalized. You should be put in jail. You should be fined. You can't say that. You need to be banned from Twitter. You need to be canceled. Instead of engaging the argument, they come after the person, you see, who, who says, well, I'm not so sure about that. And then they try to accuse us of trying to impose our values. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't feel like I got a lot of power to impose anything. They're the ones that have the power. They're, they're the ones who are, who've already warned me on Facebook that this, this article might get you into some trouble. Be careful what you write. I mean, you know, I wrote this article on the, the Equality Act, you know, and there were already, you know, some, um, some shots across my bow from Facebook. Um, and I, I mean, I've, I've already left Twitter um and um facebook may have to be next you know i mean it's it's just this is where we are today i will not be told what to, i won't even listen to your arguments and that shows a hardened heart you see it's no longer willing to even listen and you know for example i could say well you call me a hater you call me a bigot you call me a transphobe or a homophobe or a phobe some kind of phobe some kind of fearful guy I said, what if it's just simply this simple that I am, um, I, I, I have sincerely held religious beliefs and I actually believe that what God said in this book is necessary and true for our salvation. And I can't just say, well, God says no, but we can go ahead and say, yes, I just can't do it. I just, I don't have it in me because really in all humility, I really believe, I really believe what God says. And then, of course, they try to bring out the scripture scholars and say, well, you know, Paul was a bigot and uh, the Old Testament said a lot of crazy stuff. And, but, you know, when you look at this question of sexuality, I'm not just talking about homosexuality or trans. I'm talking about adultery, fornication, you know, all that stuff. It's very consistent from page one all the way to the end of the Bible that this is simply not tolerable. Um, we have got to um, see that the only place for sexual intimacy is inside biblical marriage and that's said at every stage of biblical revelation from the opening pages to the closing pages all right i know that some foods that used to be considered unclean jesus rendered clean i get that that's in the text but at no point anywhere in the text is are those teachings about sexuality changed even one iota okay so i think that um you know they may want to say all these things but i really believe that i'm as a sincere believer, I, I just cannot affirm what I, what I think God has forbidden. And I know that by faith, and I trust God, and I love God, and I never want to misrepresent his word. And I don't think that the culture can save me. I only think God can save me, and I really need to listen to him. And I hope you'll understand that I'm coming from sincerely held religious beliefs, and that's why I can't come to your gay wedding, or I can't affirm that there are 50 genders. I just, I can't. Um, maybe that doesn't mean I'm, I hate you. Um, maybe it means I love you and I care for you. And I, I want you to come and find this truth too. Because I, 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 only the truth can set us free. And I, I don't think living a lie will make you happy. But it's up to you. But I, I don't have the power to impose. I'm just simply telling you for sincerely held religious beliefs, I cannot affirm what you're asking me to affirm. Okay? And I think that's kind of the way we sometimes have to approach this. All right. So it goes on to say here, um, uh, other aspects of culture, which again, we also have to look at. Um, verse 19, as you already read, um, Stephanie, they become callous. Again, that's again, you know, roughened or hardened and have given themselves up to licentiousness, right? So, um, and to practice every kind of uncleanness. Now, um, so let's, um, what do you think is meant? Anyone want to just tell me what you think the word licentiousness means? It's a, Kind of a ten dollar word. Anything goes. Pretty much. I mean, that's a kind of a quick colloquial way of putting it. That 
you know, uh, it's an excessive, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an excessiveness of freedom, right? Um, we, um, we all certainly, you know, freedom is a generally a considered a good thing, but if we have too much of it, we, um, we can cause great harm. Yeah, a simple, obvious a example of this is, um, is the, um, um, traffic. I mean, you, you're, you're technically free to drive on whatever side of the road you want to, but unless you limit your freedom, nobody's free to drive. Unless we all agree that we'll limit our freedom and follow certain rules and laws that will keep order, then no one is free to drive. So there's really, you know, absolute freedom becomes anarchy and chaos. And the licentious ones are the ones who push the limits and think that they can go on and break uh, rules or laws or understandings um, that's set up and, and there'll be no consequences and everything will just be fine. And um, um, that is um, simply not true, right? So, um, so yeah, I would say that's a pretty good capturing of the word, all right? It's a general attitude, sometimes uh, what we call um, uh, uh, antinomianism, you know, you're just against laws in general, you know. Um, there's one thing to be kind of a libertarian, but, you know, libertarians are always trying to figure out how far their libertarian <laughs> things need to go, you know, because, you know, libertarianism can't mean anything goes. It just can't. You, you, you've got, we've got to have some limits, some, some fence marks, you know, good fences make good neighbors, right? And um, so um, we, um, uh, we, the only true human freedom is limited human freedom. It's just, it's just the facts, all right? The question is, where do we draw the line? And what's, an, uh, what's government imposition or the oligarchs, you know, limiting our freedom in an unrighteous way? And what freedom, what, what limits to our freedoms are really are necessary for the common good? And so we can just simply drive from point A to point B without getting killed, you know? Uh, so you see, we, these are all things that we have to find a balance for, all right? So, but they'd be, they, those who are licentious are recklessly celebrating their freedom, right? Now, one of the things that it says here, and it assumes it, it points this out, um, it says um, they've given themselves up to licentiousness um, and, and they are greedy to practice every kind of uncleanness. Now, so the uncleanness, now, by the way here, um, the, the, the uncleanness isn't necessarily just sexual uncleanness because it's not porneia, it's akat akatharistos, which means, you know, just to be kind of, un, you know, generally unclean. So it may or may not simply be limited to sexuality. But I would say that if you just look in our culture, that the recklessness, that sexual promiscuity, you know, that the recklessness of sexual promiscuity and the harm that it's caused, you know, you know, you think of all the abortions, 85% of abortions are performed on single women, which means a man and a woman fornicated. And so children are dying in huge numbers, a million a year in this country from that. There's just simply no other higher cause of death. We're all worked up about childhood, uh, whatever this or that. But at the end of the day, there's just nothing comparing to abortion. But then you add to that, you know, sexually transmitted diseases. You add to that um, broken families. You add to that single motherhood because many men have abandoned women when they become pregnant. Um, we, we see that uh, there's uh, many children who are raised, you know, in, in, in single parent families and the harm that that causes. We see hurt and broken lives. We see, and of course, lately here, again, where it's back in the news again, right? There's, you know, here we go with the Me Too movement again. But, uh, you know, this, this idea of uh, sexual abuse or sexual, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, um, any rate where you... Uh, you, you sexualize women and you sort of poke, you know, what am I, the sexual, anyway, lots of sexual misconduct, sexual abuse, um, sexual harassment, that's what I'm looking for, yeah. Uh, so a lot of this goes on and, you know, all of these things, you know, just come from this attitude that, you know, sex is just kind of like my thing for fun and I can kind of exploit and get it wherever I can, however I can. And a lot of people get hurt. A lot of babies get killed. A lot of children get raised in irregular situations. Um, the marriage levels have utterly plummeted in this country. Um, I think I've given these facts before. When I was a, see, 1975, there were 400,000 weddings in just Catholic churches in this country. And now, last year, there were 139,000 weddings in, in churches. 
you see. I mean, it's just, just imploded. And that's not just true for Catholics, it's true for marriage statistics across the board. Justice of the Beast, number of marriage licenses issued is just plummeted, you know. And so promiscuity attacks marriage, it attacks family, it harms children. Um, and people just say, well, if nobody is like two consenting adults, man, and it's none of anybody's business, it becomes our business. Because now you want me to pay for your abortion, pay for your contraception, pay for your transgender surgery. You want me to, you know, you want me to do all these things uh, and go along with this and say this is all just great when in fact the body count's pretty high. And it's a pretty good, clear indicator that we ought not behave this way. And then it doesn't bring us good things, it brings us bad things. But try to get, try to get anyone to admit that in the, in the secular world, you see? Okay, uh, but this is what St. Paul is saying. Now, you did not learn this in Christ. See, in other words, it's another way of saying, this is not the mind of Christ that you would behave this way, okay? Assuming that you have heard about him or taught him as the truth is in Jesus. So then put off the old man that belongs to that former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful lust. Oh, come on, you know that, you know, do you really need me to explain this phrase to you, you know? Our, our passions can just lie to us. <laughs> Ooh, you just get some revenge and you'll feel better. Next thing, next thing you know, you're arrested or you're sued. Um, or, ooh, you know, baby, you got the curves, I got the angles. Mm, mm, mm. We're just, you know, and you just have a few glasses of wine and, mm, and then all of a sudden, you know, wake up, who are you? Uh, I know we met last night. Um, uh, then she calls you three days later and, I mean, you know, three, three weeks later, and says, you know, I think I'm pregnant. God forbid you're either off to the abortionist. God forbid he does, actually. And uh, or uh, your whole life has changed. And, you know, I mean, this kind of stuff, uh, the, our passions are, are very deceitful to us. Now, anger, uh, you know, hunger, same thing. Well, we got to have one more, you know, you know, I, you know, you know, that's, that's, that's my humiliating problem. You know, I, I just don't seem to be able to, to lose the weight. But um, you see, deceitful passions, right? Our passions are not evil themselves, but they're uh, off the chain. They're, they're inordinate. They're out of whack. They're excessive. And so we have to learn to master them, see? And so of themselves, our passions are good. They all come from God. Anger, even anger, um, is, is, a, is a good passion. I don't know if you noticed, Jesus was angry a lot. Sometimes you got to be angry enough about something to do something. It means you care. Um, but on the other hand, you know, for most of us, anger can also be very unruly. And we can do the most awful things and say the most awful things that we can never unsay when we're angry. Oh, you know, but you did say it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, but you said it. You know, try to unring that bell. You know, and so again, anger can be a terrible thing. You can end up even killing somebody. Um, wow, you know, some road rage incidents, things like that, you know. So you, you see our, our, our passions, our, our lusts, they're, they're very deceitful. And they, they lie to us, okay? Um, even things like grief, which have their place. At some point, though, you have to finally say, now, look, I remember some years ago, uh, there, were, there was a certain woman whose mother had died. Her mother was 87. These things happen. Um, she just couldn't get over it. She was just devastated and just locked in just endless depression. And, you know, and I, I tried to help her and, you know, she wouldn't go see a psychiatrist. And, but, you know, it was just it, at some point I had to finally say to her, look, I'm sorry, but your, your grief is excessive. These things happen. Your mother was bound to die. And, um, at some level, you just you have to finally get on and give her back to God with gratitude and get up and live your life. And um, anyway, she just kind of wanted someone to cry on, her, on their shoulder, you know, wanted to cry on her shoulder. But uh, this shoulder bumped her back a little and says, no, enough of that. You got to get back up again, you know. And um, so at some level, again, all of these passions, grief, anger, um, hunger, um, Desire for sexual intimacy, um, you know, even desire for a drink or something. I'm, I am I am talking about an alcoholic beverage. All these things may have their place. The Bible does say God gives wine to cheer man's heart, but you know, 
one glass or so is okay, but three bottles, well, you're probably getting a little drunk by now, you know? <laughs> so again, most things are enjoyed and all things are best enjoyed in moderation, but deceitful lust, okay? And remember the word deceit, and then we'll move on. Deceit, to be deceived, it means to be picked up and carried off somewhere. So um, think of, it's a very violent word. It's think of a um, prey, like a rabbit, hanging half dead from the mouth of a wolf. Was, its neck has already been snapped and it's just sort of there. And the wolf carries it off to its lair to devour it. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what the word deceit mean, means to be picked up and carried off somewhere. Okay, so, all right, so that's um, um, good, good, good for that. Now, there is a question from, uh, let's see, Christian, look in the chat box here. I don't have that open. Um, okay, I don't answer. A homosexual acquaintance who says he's Catholic, but asked me to pray for his ailing dog, which I refuse. I think I do have audio now, Monsignor. Um, uh -huh. um, so anyway, I spell it out in the question. Um, I he he um be, becomes angry when i have the temerity to suggest that i won't pray for a dog but i will pray for his intentions um uh yeah well you know you you i, I don't know what him being a homosexual would have to do with it here except to say that um you well know. that the anniversary party is that that part of it um catholic anniversary oh yeah oh i see yeah. yeah, no, I wouldn't go to the anniversary party. Um, but I, I think as far as praying for his dog, I say, well, I'll certainly pray for your intention that your dog gets well. Okay. Um, you know, something like that. No, I, I, I actually have a kind of a, uh, sometimes people ask me for it. I have actually written out a suggested response to people who receive invitations to either gay weddings or sometimes to a person who's getting married for the third time and it's not in the Catholic church, but one of them is Catholic. These types of things, you know, say, look, I, I thank you for the invitation and um, I continue to uh, hold you in my heart, but I want you to know that for sincerely held religious beliefs, I'm, I'm not able to come to, this, to the celebration because to celebrate or to attend means that I'm celebrating what's taking place and I, I can't. I really, in my, in my heart of hearts, believe that God said that this isn't something we should be doing. And I'll continue to pray for you. And if you ever want to talk about it more, and um, uh, I want for you what I want for myself. I want to be with God forever. And um, I, I have to follow my conscience here. You know, something to that effect. And um, so it's kind, it's firm, the answer is clear, and you're not getting into the issue uh, per se at that time. You know, you're inviting them. Um, but I wouldn't go to an anniversary party. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't take it well. I, I, I managed to evade that every time, but he doesn't take it well. If you want, uh, uh, um, is it, is, is it, it's Kirsten, not Kristen. Okay. Kirsten, actually. Kirsten. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I can send you my little boilerplate thing that you can adapt. Okay. You can send me an email to remind me and I'll, uh, look it up and send it to you. Sure. It's also in my book, Catholic and Curious. Yeah. Uh -huh. suggested reply uh -huh. good okay Thanks. we all get into these awkward situations these days you know yeah i will tell you that one time i was at a party with my roman collar on and uh some guy came up and introduced me to his spouse who was another guy standing next to him and um you know remember i'm wearing my collar and i think you know i i don't i don't think it was just some neutral thing i think they were probably trying to tweak me i can't be sure but he just said, well, I'm, I'm happy to, to meet you. I'm not comfortable with this use of the word spouse. I hope you'll understand, you know, I'm a, I'm a Catholic, but I wish you both well. And, um, but I, I, just, I just need to tell you, I'm not comfortable with using that word spouse in this case. And I, um, I <laughs> and they kind of walked off, you know. So, and, and as I say, I, I, I just, uh, I, I don't think that sometimes we are so, oh, I don't want to offend, I don't want to upset anybody. I want to get along and I want to, you know, but at times, I think when people just kind of come up into our face with stuff and want to draw us into something, we have to sometimes just stand our ground and say, I'm happy to meet you. Uh, I'm not comfortable with that use of the term, um, uh, but um, I, I, uh, I, I, uh, I wish you both well. And, um, uh, you know, but they just, you know, by that time, they, you know, wrote me off as a bigot and walked away. I mean, what were they, well, maybe they thought I was James Martin. I don't know. 
unfortunately, there are some bad priests out there. But, um, you know, anyway. So, okay. Well, and again, um, I, I want to also add to all this, as we just mentioned it a lot. Um, I, I know any number of people with same-sex attraction. We prefer in the church to call it same-sex attraction rather than the homosexuality, which was a term coined in the 1850s. Um, but same-sex attraction, um, they, they live very heroically. They live chastely. Um, they're, they're not out there, you know, going to bathhouses or they're not trying to engage in marriages or in romantic relationships. They, they know what, what God expects, you know, that uh, they're to live celibately or chastely in that sense. They know what it means for them and, and they live it very well. And it's just, it's just very heroic. And we have a, a group in the church called um, Courage. Courage, yeah. And then Encourage for parents of people uh, who are, have same-sex attraction. And again, many of these people live uh, admirably and they're trying to stay close to Christ in, inside the teaching. And um, so we always want to commend them, even though um, sometimes we, you know, we, we, we think there's this big picture of all these people who are living contrary to the gospel. There are people with same-sex attraction who do heroically live very chastely. Okay, and I would say anybody, if any, you know, even if they don't have same-sex attraction, who's living chastely, that's heroic these days. Okay, because there's every reason to think, well, this doesn't, you know, this doesn't apply anymore, and you know, sadly, they can hire teachers to tell them that. Well, we haven't exactly made huge progress in this text, have we? But anyway, there's a lot here. Uh, but again, it goes on to say here then. Put off the old man that belongs to your former manner of life that is corrupt through deceitful lust. So again, their former manner of life, they've come out of this, you see, this kind of world of uh, the Greco-Roman culture, which was very sexually promiscuous. They had abortion, but even wor they call it, um, by the way, a lot of times when you see the word sorcery in the Bible, the Greek word behind that is pharmakeia, where we get the word pharmacy. And generally what sorcerers did at that time was to conjure, not conjure, but I mean, make up these potions that would induce abortion, okay? So um, in effect, you're dealing with chemical abortion, okay? So abortion was common, but you know, more often they just committed outright infanticide. A child came along from a prostitute or someone doesn't want it and into the river, off to into the Tiber River, you know, um, and... Um, there were actually many Christians who, you know, kept watch by the rivers as um, as these um, as these children were discarded and they would try to rescue them, you know, and a very, very sad thing from the ancient world. You know, a lot of infanticide. OK, be renewed. Verse 23 says in the spirit of your minds. Right now, this word spirit of your minds. Um, OK. We talked about this before. We sometimes get a little bit lazy. We think we have souls, but animals no, don't. No, every living thing has a soul. All we mean by the word soul in both philosophy and theology is it's the animating principle of a living being. So a plant has some animating principle called the soul. It has a plant soul, not a human or an animal soul. An animal has an animating quality called the soul. It's just, it's, it's uh, so, but what distinguishes us from the animals is not that we have a soul, but that we have a rational soul, a spiritual soul. So the idea is that um, we can reason, we can think, we can even think about thinking. Um, we, animals do not have this. Now you say, well, how do you know, Father? You don't know. You're just being mean because the animal rights people tell me that, you know, and they're smarter than we are and all this kind of stuff. All right. So. And you've heard me on this before. I mean, if animals are in the same league that we are, look, we're all, let's just take mammals. My cat's a mammal. Uh, you know, look, whales are mammals. You know, I mean, even though they look like fish, but they're actually mammals. They, have, they breathe air and they, they nurse their young. Um, so uh, there's lots of mammals out there. And there's a lot of similarities to between me and my cat. You know, lungs, eyes, you know, ears, you know, okay. But the similarities stop there at the physical. If you really look, I mean, we are, we are just, we're in a completely different category from the animals. If animals are like, just like we are, where is their progress? Where are their cities? Where are their libraries? Where, is their, where are their works of art and poetry? 
Where are their courts? Where are their legislatures? Where they, uh, their bicameral legislatures, where they debate justice and pass laws? Um, where, uh, where, where, where are their courts where they hold each other accountable uh, to these laws? Um, where is their body of knowledge and how has it grown? Have they gone to the moon and back? Why not? Um, have they in fact even changed in 10,000 years? You know, have they done anything to be other than just a cat or a dog or a cow or a mule? They, they don't make, pro they, they don't think like we, we do, see? So you know something by its fruits. So you say, well, how can you really know, Father? I know because you know something by its fruits. And the, we are in a completely different category from the animals, physically similar, mammals, bodies. But the spiritual soul, See, the spirit of your, of your mind, see, that's that part that God whoosh, breathed into Adam and Adam became a spiritual soul, you see. Um, we think, we offer to God rational worship. My cat offers worship to God just by being a beautiful cat. I have one of the most beautiful cats in the world. And the second most beautiful cat was found by Joy uh, and is now owned by another friend of mine, Yolanda, but they're both calicos. Beautiful animals. And just the beauty of that animal just praises God, you know, but not intelligently, you know. Jewel doesn't pray. She doesn't know God. Uh, but we do. We offer God a rational worship. We, we offer, you know, these, these uh, to God are rational, our spiritual, our, we're aware. Now, that's a conversation that you'll have to have with people that love their pets so much that they think that they're human. Yeah, right, right. And again, I, I think our pets are wonderful. I've had, I've had great experiences with dogs growing up. And now that I'm living in the city, cats are much easier. I mean, you know, yeah, a dog, you got to walk that darn thing twice, three times a day or pay somebody. I forget it, man. I ain't happy. I don't have time for that. But anyway, but I mean, I love my dogs and they seem very human-like, don't they? they? They seem to get all excited and joyful. They have a basic vocabulary. Even my cat, you know, cats are a lot harder to train. But if I just say treat, she goes, Whoop, she's up and she's running and coming and, you know, she knows what to expect, you know, a little, a little treat. And, um, but on the other hand, um, you know, a lot of this can also be explained, especially with dogs by pack loyalty. And, um, you know, there's, um, you know, um, there's a lot of, um, a lot of that among dogs. And so I, I don't mean to completely discard it and say that they aren't sentient beings who they can suffer, they feel. They're not sentient in the sense that they think rationally, though. It's basic instincts. I like you. I love you because you give me, you, you rub my back. You uh, give me food, shelter. You know, you're a part of, you know, you're the pack. You're part of the pack that I belong to, you know. Um, but it's not, I think it's pretty rudimentary because they don't go out and buy gift cards for you. Um, they don't, um, you know, you know what I'm saying. It's, it's, a, it's very rudimentary stuff. Anyway, I know people love their dogs, though, Stephanie, and I love my cat. I do. Oh, um, cats and dogs. I mean, even yeah. the cat lovers are, are worse because they they will say, I have a cousin in Florida, and she lost her cat, and she she's just still Sorry. grieving after two years. Oh, yeah. It's harder with animals because you really can't say goodbye. You know, they don't understand what's happening. And, you know, whereas a human being, you can talk, how you doing, you know, and I was talking to a parishioner who's in, you know, actively dying now. And I said, are you ready? And she said, yeah. And um, I gave her sacraments and we talked a little bit and I could say goodbye, but um, um, not with an animal, you know, you can't do that. So it's harder in a way. Yeah. But anyway, I, I, I also have the thought that many of, I, I don't have any doubts that, I mean, I, I, I can't prove it, but that our, Many of our pets will be with us one day in heaven because simply because of their association with us. I mean, part of, uh, part of, part of our, what, we've, what we are. And um, I think we'll have access to them somehow. I don't mean to say that every cow that ever you know, was, uh, existed will exist one day again. But I do think certain special animals and things uh, could easily, I could easily see that they'd be with us in heaven. You know? So at any rate, all that's just a way of saying they won't have the beatific vision. They'll... They're just animals, they, they, all right? But uh, we, you know, let me, another way of putting it is that St. Thomas Aquinas makes a very important distinction. He says, animals can experience pleasure, but not joy. I don't mean the person joy here. <laughs> uh, but I mean that, that, 
that experience of joy. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, the experience of joy, because that requires an, uh, an, an intellect, that, you know, um, and um, joy is uh, a deep, serene, confident, uh, and stable sense of well-being that comes from that comes from thinking through um, what God has done for me. You see. And it's rooted in gratitude and things like that. So, so I think that's a good distinction. You know, it's clear that animals experience pleasure, and they're happy. They're happy when we come home. Um, but it's not the joy that you know that that, that really is a, that we experience as human beings. And likewise, the sorrow. Um, you know, uh, there's no there's no sense that animals become inconsolable. Sometimes they do strange things when their master dies, and they go looking and wondering and but there's no sense that they're just struck and they're weeping and moaning and, um, you know, having some, some huge, uh, they, they're experiencing a loss, but they're not suffering like we do, you see. Okay, well, we've gotten far afield here. Um, let's go to verse 25 to the end of this chapter. Let's at least finish it. To, so would you like to, Stephanie, finish it out for us, tw verse 25 to the end of the chapter? Sure. Therefore... Putting away falsehood, let everyone speak the truth with his, with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, so that he may be able to give those in need. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for edifying, as fits the occasion, that it may impart grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. All right. So you see that Paul is moving from the doctrinal part of the letter that we had earlier to the, uh, the more pastoral community life section of the letter, how to, how to live with one another. So therefore putting away all fa of falsehood, let everyone speak the truth with his neighbor for we're members of one another. Now, two things to be noted here. Um, first of all, uh, let everyone speak the truth to his neighbor. Now, Paul doesn't develop it here, but St. Thomas, for example, indicates that we, what, what we call here fraternal correction, where we correct a brother, we have different obligations depending on a number of factors, how well we know the person, um, how well we, um, you know, whether we're uh, older than them or younger than them, um, whether or not uh, they're, that they're, we're in a, a subordinate role like at work or we're in the supervisory role. So obviously those in, who are older have a higher obligation to correct those who are younger, those who are in supervisory or parental roles. Um, are, have more, uh, opp not opportunity, well, they do have, but, uh, but uh, obligation to correct their children and so forth. Um, now, also, it's, un it's unclear here whether Paul's talking about their neighbor, in other words, inside the church, or just any neighbor that lives nearby you. Um, it says we are members of one another. That would only be technically true of those who are baptized and members of the body of Christ. So he may be speaking here particularly of the obligation to correct a brother or a sister in the Lord. Um, but I would argue, though, that we, have, we do have more obligation than we think when it comes to correcting even just our unbelieving neighbors. Um, when and how we do that is going to be kind of tricky. But why? We're members of one another. Let's just say this. We're all Americans. And we see that our country in many ways in the last, you know, 30, 40 years is just falling to pieces. I mean, when you can't even find the right bathroom and agree on that, that's really mixed up. That's very, very serious. And how have we gotten into this condition of darkness? 
and confusion? Well, mostly because people like us have stayed silent. We were hiding out, not wanting to get into controversies, none of my business, um, that kind of stuff. And um, we forget that we're members of one another. And that when some of us start to think that, well, you know, um, gee, uh, maybe uh, living together outside of marriage is like, you know, a good thing. I mean, when I was a kid, that was unthinkable, called shacking up. And people sometimes did it, but it was considered very disgraceful and something that, you know, decent people just wouldn't do. Um, it would often lead to families utterly disowning children for this type of, you know, just brazen behavior. Uh, divorce was not that common. It was frowned upon and also considered disgraceful. But through the 60s, all this stuff started to fall apart. And where were our bishops? Where were the priests? Well, we were all turning altars around and tuning up guitars and finding out who had power to do what in the church. And we were kind of distracted by our, you know, the all the liturgical changes. And where were we when the no-fault divorce passed in this country? You know, railroaded through every state in this land. Where were we? You know, where were our bishops? I, I see very little evidence, maybe one or two bishops that even publicly complained about it. Um, where was the church? See, um, why did we get so quiet about children, you know, young people having sex and um, all this crazy foolishness on television that portrays this as cool and hip? Uh, where, you know, we, we've been very, very quiet about this stuff. And, and when I say the church, I don't just mean clergy, I mean parents, I mean others, you know. Um, so I, I don't want to entirely interpret this passage as only referring to within the church that we should correct one another, but that somewhere, even if we do it more corporately through our bishops, our clergy, through church teaching, through seminars, through all kinds of different ways that we could do on YouTube and things that this is not the way to walk. And we do some of that today. All right. But um, it's, um, it's been a very quiet period in a very tumultuous time. And so I don't want to wholly set aside the idea that we're all members of one another, even if not in the body of Christ, simply as Americans or people who live in the Western world. And I love our culture and I, I, I love Western democracy. And I, I'm just grieved at what's happened to us. You know, I really, I love that. I'm like St. Augustine, he loved Rome and the culture of Rome. And um, he, he deeply lamented that Rome was just falling to pieces. And he wrote this big, thick tome called The City of God. If you ever want to spend I'm, senior, I'm, a, um, I'm a movie buff when it comes to sci-fi and adventure. Yeah. And I, I, this reminds me, the last thing that I read, the last passage, reminds me of, um, do you remember Invasion of the Body Snatchers? Mm -hmm. When yeah. they all wanted to convert people back to no PDAs in public. And, you yeah. know, it was like everybody had to turn into these not zombies, but yeah. you, you're going back to a way of life where it was almost like things were valued, but you didn't have to be over, you know, you didn't have to overexert it. Yeah. Because I, I look back at the time when I was administrator in the, in the high school and mm -hmm. you did have rules that there was no PDA. Yeah, right. Did not have that. And Can then all of a sudden it, it figured out. Huh? Well, you better say what PDA means, you know, public oh. displays of affection. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, no, back in my day, even in the high school, man, we were holding out to hold hands with girls and we'd, um, you know, there were, I, I'm not saying I got involved in, during school hours like that, but they'd be smooching on the, <laughs> out there in the common area, you know, just, uh, anyway, yeah, so you're right. So anyway, all, all I can say is that, um, look, we, we um, some, somewhere we've got to be better about being outspoken about the issues of our day. It takes a lot of courage and you will be defunded, deplatformed, um, canceled, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and we're gonna have to find new ways to getting the word out again and find our own platforms, but we have to shout it from the housetops or just in the old fashioned way, print out pamphlets or whatever we need to do, but we need to call people to Christ and not just go out and denounce, but say, there's a better way, come walk in it, okay. Now, moving on, I got to move through these quickly because it's getting late. We're up in an hour now. Um, be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity for the devil. So basically what it's saying here is be angry, but do not sin. So there is, an, there is such an anger that's not sinful. It's rooted in just, um, just, you know, you're concerned for justice or something important. We also have, you know, and St. Thomas says that anger can be right or wrong based on both its object 
and its intensity. So in terms of the object, it could be something important like, you know, I'm angry at the injustice or I'm angry that people don't know the Lord or that people are being prevented from speaking of Christ in the schools, but you can teach kids how to put on condoms, but not how, not how to put on Christ Jesus. Um, I'm angry about that. Um, but on the other hand, well, someone dissed me or they took my parking spot or <sighs> and I get all angry and, you know, that's kind of petty stuff. So Thomas would say that free, we, dis, we distinguish good or holy anger from unholy or, 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 or sinful anger based, first of all, on the object. Is the object of the anger worthy of anger? Second thing is intensity. Even sometimes if uh, you're, you know, we're rightly angry about something, that doesn't give us a right to yell and scream and break things and riot and loot and burn stuff down and some of the stuff we're seeing in our culture today. It doesn't give me the right to, you know, call you horrible names. It doesn't give me the right to, um, you know, to uh, destroy you or ruin your reputation. You know, all these things we have to uh, realize that, that even if the object of our anger is correct, that doesn't give us the right to just vent our anger. And then, uh, obviously, um, if it's unrighteous anger, the idea of doing those things is even worse. OK, so OK, so don't let the sun go down on your anger unless sense deal with it. Your anger has a voice. Talk to it. Work through it. Do the best you can, you know, and I, I think, you know, we all know that there's going to sometimes be more than one day that we'll deal with an anger about something. So, but it, it's just a, a kind of an expression. It means, you know, don't let your anger just go on simmering forever, you know, deal with your anger, work through it, find out what's righteous and good. Um, I've learned that if there's a righteous anger that you, one of the things you want to try to do is, first of all, don't stuff it where it becomes depression and don't just vent it. But every day say, I'm going to do something today to respect this anger and try to move the ball. Uh, there's a situation in the parish that I've got to deal with or whatever. So I'll do a little bit today, get a few things done for tomorrow, and then I'll finally call a meeting and do what I need to do. But I may not be able to get everything done in one day, but I'm respecting the voice of my anger that says, this does need to be dealt with. Um, but I, I don't want to do it while I'm just, you know, kind of feeling initially angry. I, I want to think through my anger and find out kind of sort it all out and find out what um, what is uh, what's the best prudent way to handle this, okay? So it's, it's an expression. It doesn't literally mean you can solve all your anger before you go to bed. Um, it's, uh, but it does, it does mean, you know, don't let the devil go on, you know, stirring this anger. Work with it. Listen to its voice. Discern with God is it's a righteous and a good anger. And then, you know, respect its voice or say, well, that's not worthy of anger. And I repent, Lord. Okay. Uh, let no thief, the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his hands. Notice so that he may give to those in need. You know, we don't just work for our good or for just our family, but ideally we work so that we can have a little extra to help the poor. See, I'll, I'll let that go because we have to keep moving, but um, you know, we, we don't just labor for ourselves. Okay. Uh, oh, well, I'll get the money so I can buy the boat um, or I'll get the money so I can get the beach house. Well, maybe, you know, maybe, but w w w are there any poor members of the family who needs help? Do you really need all this stuff? You see, so greed, of course, is a, the gift that keeps on taking because <laughs> you're never happy. You always want more and realize that it's kind of a lie. You're not getting more doesn't make you happier. All right. You need, we need basics. Okay. But at the end of the day, more and more and more doesn't mean, you know, the, 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 there's diminishing returns. So we want to try to be generous to the poor. Okay. Uh, number 29, let no evil talk come out of your mouth, but only the only such as is good for edifying as fits the occasion that it may impart grace to those who hear. And that doesn't mean you're just pleasant all the time and have a smiley face, but not. It means, you know, don't let evil talk come out of your mouth. In other words, say only the good things that people need to hear, things that will really help them. Now, sometimes that is a rebuke. Uh, sometimes it's it's more of um uh, you know it will be you know a consolation or uh, uh, where you praise somebody and say I'm really grateful for what you've done you know um, you know so in other words you see we want to be careful because you know there's a lot of harm that can come out of our mouth and um, sometimes people get a little myopic about things in confession you know there are certain sins that cause us a lot of shame. And people tend to focus on them, like sins of, regarding sexuality, you know, 
pornography or masturbation. They're kind of embarrassing and, and they kind of bring a lot of angst to people who struggle with them. Um, and they, they should. There's, there's, there's things that are definitely wrong there. But, you know, there's almost no attention paid to what comes out of their mouth all day long. And so the danger sometimes is that we so focus on the sins that we consider shameful that we sometimes have to wonder, well, why am I not ashamed of some of the terrible things I say all day long? Now, I'm not saying everybody does it all the time, but you get, you get the idea. We don't want to become too myopic uh, when we look at, you know, um, sin. We don't just mean sins of the flesh, but there's other sins, sins of speech, sins of the intellect, of thought, that say, you know, sins of attitudes that we express, uh, greed and... Um, um, where we, you know, we, in effect, we're stealing from the poor um, because of our greed. Um, not literally stealing, but if I have two coats, one of them belongs to the poor. That my excess belongs to others. That God gave all the goods of this world for all the people of this world. So I learned to share. So, but we don't, we can get to this place where we're all focused on, well, I'm drinking too much. So I'm going to just think about drinking, drinking, and not drinking. And I'm a hero if I didn't drink, or I'm a hero if I didn't masturbate this week. But what, well, okay, but what was coming out of your mouth all day long? How are you treating the poor? What's going on, you know, with how you, you know, treat your employees if you're an employer or your friends or your wife or your spouse or your children, you know? There's deeper things, you see. And so um, our mouth is a very important source of both edification and sin. And, you know, the book of James, of course, we read last time, uh, not long ago, covered that in quite great extent, Okay goes on to say, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How will we grieve the Holy Spirit of God? By resisting him. See, there's only one, remember how Jesus says, only blasphemy against the Holy Spirit can't be forgiven. What does Jesus mean by that? Basically what he means is that I wholly disregard the Holy Spirit's testimony to me and I refuse to repent of my sins. See, God can't forgive a sin that you just don't, want forgiveness because you don't think it's for anything wrong with it and there's a lot of people that are just you know you know shaking their fist to god and they're grieving the holy spirit see um verse 31 leave all bitter let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice wow how many people in our culture need to hear that today i mean it is amazing to me you know as the years have ticked by just how bitterly angry we become at one another and the things we say about people from the other party or certain politicians and look we have definite policy differences with certain politicians but that doesn't give us a right to call them names or to you know just you know you know f you know all, all these people who wrote f trump all over the city and or uh, you know i don't know people who don't like joe biden calling him you know i don't know adult or stupid or you know, I, know. I, I, I think somewhere along the line, these are human beings. They deserve our respect. They are leaders. They should be given their proper titles. And uh, even if we have policy disagreements, we need to find a way to speak to those things in a way like a Christian should. And I think um, people want, I mean, a lot of people are trying to bait our bishops to become more, more vicious in the whole you know, political arena. Um, but I, I think that we have to stay in, a, in, a, in an engaged the dialogue whether or not joe biden and other people should be receiving communion i'm not going to get into that i i personally don't think that they that, that they should if they but but that's uh but i, I think the, the the deeper question is is why do i care about joe biden as a man i mean i, I also care about the scandal that maybe someone like him receiving communion after celebrating a gay gay marriages on several occasions um as as the actual justice of the peace um, and of course, his position on funding abortion and so on. I have a lot of disagreements with him, but I don't hate this man. And I want him to go to heaven. And I just hope and pray somebody's gotten him and say, you know, you're going to go to God soon. You're going to stand before him. You're going to answer to him. And what will you say? Has anybody ever just sat him down? Or do they just fawn? You know, a lot of politicians, people just fawn over them. They're surrounded by sycophants. And then outside that circle, there are people who want to throw rocks. And there's nothing in between where somebody who just really cares about them as a person goes to them and says, look, I just need you to know something. You know, I care about, you. I want you to be in heaven one day with me and I want to be in heaven. 
And so, you know, somewhere, you know, you know, so there's different ways for us to think about these things and approach them. But if you watch too much of the cable news, you're going to just come away angry and all these stuff, angry, wrathful, bitter, uh, slander, you know, just terrible things, name calling, um, things that are just sometimes just not even true that are spread around, you know, that he said this or he said that. And if you actually go and listen to the talk, he didn't really say that at all he or she or whoever it is, okay? So I think there's just an awful lot of this in our culture. And I just simply say that somewhere along the line as Christians that we need to not imitate that. And we can easily fall prey to imitating this stuff from the culture. And there's a lot of stuff coming out of people's mouths that there's no business for that stuff coming out of any Christian's mouth, all right? Okay, policy differences aside. It says here simply be kind to one another, okay? Tenderhearted, forgiving as God and Christ forgave you. This has to, of course, immediately start in our families, right? Um, that's where the most forgiveness is needed because that's where the most pain is caused because we care about each other. A lot of patience, tenderheartedness, forgiveness. But that doesn't mean we don't correct and rebuke and admonish. Um, but we do that with a tender heart. I really love you. I care about you. See, I'm not just trying to win an argument. See, I, I care about you. I care about your salvation and you're a son or a daughter of God. And somewhere I think you've kind of lost your way on this particular issue or that particular matter. So what can we do to get you back? See, and that's so different than just, you know, railing at your enemy. Why, you know, you know, you might as well just say, go to hell, you know, when what we want is for them to go to heaven. And that requires a, a tender heart. Okay. All right. Now said more than enough, father. We are done here. Okay, it's uh, yeah, we went on for about an hour and 10 tonight. So, okay, well, listen, uh, any quick comments, questions, rebuttals before we do formally end? You know, we talk not about a rebuttal or anything. I'm just wondering, um, are we going to be able to put the recordings? I'd love to send them to people. Um, okay. So, yeah, okay. You, you know, Joy, what you need to do, um, uh, it helps me if you send me an email reminder, Father, uh, get those things out because they're sitting on my computer and it's just like, oh my gosh, you know, I got paperwork here and this and that. Yeah, it, of is, course. it is something I need to get done. And uh, yeah. sometimes it just helps to be reminded. Yeah, we'll do. Mm -hmm. Okay, appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Other um, comments or questions? I know these are some of these are tough moral topics today. We all do struggle because people kind of built a lot of their feelings into their identity today. They set up these identities. And then um, if you don't just kind of go along with the whole picture, you hate me. And again, I, I think that the charge is, is, is um, not fair. Um, just because I don't agree with something, it doesn't mean I hate you. Um, but, you know, to those who hate the truth, the truth begins to sound hateful. And, but it's never our intention to hate. Um, we can always assure people of that, but I, I simply there are just some things I'm being asked to affirm that I cannot do because I love God. And um, <laughs> there was a, one deacon who uh, said to his, who, he, he, he said in a homily anyway, he said, I said to my wife one day when she suggested that we might uh, skip church and he had her permission, he said, this was many years ago. He said, sorry, dear, I love God more than I love you. <laughs> <laughs> take the dagger out but i mean it's true i mean we want to love we always have to love god most and more than we love anybody else and hopefully our love for god will help us in a loving way to go to people and say i know you're going to give it to me with both barrels but i can't i just can't affirm what you want me to do i just can't go along with that because i love god most of all okay all right let's pray but we do ask uh, for your love and your mercy and your grace because there's a lot of a lot of things that are needed in our world today and we um, we're supposed to be your voice your prophets so help us to help others uh, to come to know the truth and help us especially in those most controversial issues today to be able to withstand the likely pushback we'll get and just know that we we mean it in love and that we do it in love but above all we love you who are truth itself all these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Father, I have one little message for, for Daniel, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> Happy birthday, Daniel. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Thanks for recognizing me. Yeah. What's that? It's on Saturday. It's is his birthday. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah, but March sixth. Wonderful. All right. Well, thanks. Quick question. I, I didn't. I didn't really notice the thing in the background there, and I'm glad you did, Stephanie. So, uh -huh. thanks for leading us in that little uh, tribute to our brother. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Quick, quick question, Monsignor. Where's your blog? Is it called Community and Mission? Yeah, that, that's their name for it. I never use that. It's Monsignor Pope's blog. That's what everybody calls it. But it's um, blog.adw.org. Okay, I got it. Yeah. All right, thanks. All right. Thank Good. you for tonight. Okay, thank you. Blessings one and all. Thank you, thank you everyone. Good night, Good everyone. Have a blessed week. You too.